Now, I've been your pastor for the better part of 20 years, and for most of that time, I've preached at least three sermons a week. That means I have delivered to you more than 2,500 sermons, and none of them has been from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, and I can tell you I've been perfectly content with that. I could pastor and preach another 15 to 20 years and not have to come back to this text, and I'd be happy with that as well. But we are preaching line by line, precept upon precept, through the book of Hebrews, and so we come to this hotly debated section of Scripture. Some would submit that it is the most controversial verses in the Bible. The late Dr. J. Vernon McGee, who I would commend for your listening, and the radio program through the Bible. Dr. McGee says this is the most difficult passage in the Bible for any interpreter to handle, regardless of the theological position he may hold. Personally, when I listen to men like John MacArthur, Jerry Vines, Warren Wiersbe, J. Vernon McGee, and others, and find that they each hold divergent views on the proper rendering of this text, it makes a faithful Bible student approach the text with what I think is a God-given humility. So if you hold or should come to hold a different position than the one your pastor holds, in today's case, that's perfectly fine. We don't have to agree on it, uh, but I'll just simply say there's more that will be left unsaid than can be said about these verses. If I were writing a commentary, it would extend into volume after volume, but today's message is limited by my clock and your bladder. And so we'll have to be somewhat limited today. Now before we get to the controversy and the interpretation of this passage, I want to share with you, just to be good Bible students, four principles of interpretation that should guide our analysis of any text and this text specifically. Now there are more than four principles you need to have in mind when you try to study and interpret the Bible. But I just want to mention four of them at the outset. The first is... Uh, arguably the most important, and that is context. When it comes to interpreting the Bible, you've heard it said that context is king, or that a text without a context is just a pretext. The Bible should be studied in its context. Grammatically, what is the verse that comes right before it? What is the verse that comes right after it? What is the message of that larger chapter? Indeed, what is the message of that whole book? Who is the writer? What is the audience? What is the purpose for which that book was written? And then, how does that fit into the context of the whole counsel of the Word of God? So context is vitally important. Secondly, I'll mention the word consistency. And by that I mean the Bible does not contradict itself. And any interpretation of any single verse must be consistent with the whole message of the whole Bible consistency, context. Then I would give you the word clarity. Theologians call it the doctrine of perspicuity. That's a big word that simply means we believe the main message and the central thrust of the Bible is easily understood. It is clearly discernible to the simplest and most unlearned person. That is, you don't have to have multiple PhDs in theological studies to be able to understand the primary message of the Word of God, but filled by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, taught by the Holy Spirit. Even the most uneducated person in this assembly today can open up the blessed Word of God, and you can get a word from God from the Word of God. Psalm 19.7 puts it this way, that the testimony of the Lord, that's a synonym for the Scripture, that the Word of God, the testimony of the Lord is sure, that is, it's reliable, it's trustworthy, it's dependable, making wise the simple. Now, when the Bible writer uses the word simple, that's a nice way of saying those that would otherwise be ignorant, uneducated, and unlearned, you can become wise through studying the Bible. The Bible is not God's secret coded message to His people. The Bible is God's revelation to His people. So look for clarity. You might say that the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. There's context, consistency, clarity. And finally, I would give you the word counsel. 
Now, the interpretation of the Bible is never done by majority vote or by committee, but we would do well to ask, what do other faithful men and women down through the ages who've studied the Bible accurately, what do they teach and preach the text says? I would caution you that just because a whole bunch of people say that it means one thing, that doesn't mean that that's the right interpretation. But I would submit that if you're the only one who interprets a text one way out of 2,000 years of Christian study, you don't have it right. (laughs) There have been a couple of occasions in my ministry that I get late in the week getting ready to preach, and I turn to commentaries or sermons from other faithful preachers, and I discover that the way that I have viewed that text, I can't find anybody else who sees that in the passage. And so on those occasions, I've set my sermon to the side and preached something else. Have enough humility to seek counsel from other faithful students of the Word of God. Now with all of that as a backdrop, I'm going to give you something a little different today. Rather than what we might call an exegetical outline that moves verse by verse and word by word through the text, I want to give you what I call a teaching outline. Some broad principles, a skeleton, if you will, of the text, and then we'll see how much meat we can hang on that skeleton. For example, I wish for us, first of all, to consider the primary interpretations of the text. Now, in my extensive study of these verses, I have categorized the major interpretations of Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, into five different categories. Some see more. Some see less, but I think that these five would give us a good head start. There are variants of these five, but I find in these five interpretations, two of them are not plausible. Two of them cannot be supported by God's Word. I'll I'll call them flawed interpretations, and then we'll see three that I would deem as faithful interpretations. Let's think first of all about these flawed interpretations interpretations. There are at least a couple that simply cannot be supported by the Word of God even though they are held widely by a large number of people. The first flawed interpretation is that this warning is just a hypothetical, uh, primarily because of the use of the word if that you find in the King James translation, if they have fallen away. This interpretation theory says the writer uses a hyperbole to describe an impossibility. For example, if I were to say to you, for example, that if I were to drink beveraged alcohol, my sainted granny stone would roll over in her grave. You would understand that's a figure of speech. I'm describing an impossibility, and I'm using a hyperbole as a literary device. There are those who think the writer of Hebrews is just using a literary device, the idea that somebody can fall away and never be saved again, using it to describe a hypothetical and impossibility. I would just simply say that it doesn't make much sense to warn people about something that cannot happen to anyone. I find this theory so flawed, I want to do little more than simply mention it to you for your information. The second flawed interpretation, the main one, is that this passage teaches a person can lose their salvation. If you were to encounter someone from a different doctrinal stripe that believes that a genuine Christian can ever become lost again, invariably they will turn to this section of Scripture. This is admittedly one of five or six passages in the Bible that are used by people to teach that you can lose your salvation. And I would contend that each of those passages is a debatable passage whose meaning is open to disagreement. Never ever interpret a single verse to contradict the many verses. And never interpret an unclear or debatable verse to contradict those that are crystal clear. Is there any passage in the Bible? Are there any verses in the Bible which clearly teach that a person cannot lose their salvation? Absolutely, yes. I don't think we could consult, remember the principle of counsel? I don't think we could consult a greater expert on the doctrine of salvation than the author and captain of salvation, Jesus Christ himself. 
In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning in verse 27, Jesus said of his true followers, My sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. Time out. You don't have any right to claim assurance of faith, to say, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved, if you don't listen to his voice and follow him. But Jesus said that his sheep do listen to his voice, they do follow him, and he says, I give them, not temporary life, not potential life, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. That means if anyone that is ever saved ever lost that salvation, they've lost eternal life, and they subsequently perish, that means Jesus is a liar about the doctrine of salvation. And that's a very strange doctrinal position to hold. The Savior goes on to say, No one will snatch them out of my hand. And my Father who has given them to me. By the way, if you're saved, did you know you are God the Father's gift to God the Son, Jesus Christ? And Jesus said, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. If you have ever repented of your sin and truly trusted Christ, you're in the double grip of grace, in the strong hand of God the Father, in the strong grip of Christ the Son. By the way, some people ask me, Brother Mike, do you believe in the perseverance of the saint? I sure do. I just don't believe in the perseverance of the sinner. You don't have any right to claim perseverance if you're not a child of God. Jesus also famously said in John 3, 16, that anybody that would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I say again simply, if everlasting life could ever end, it was never everlasting to start with. Jude speaks of the power of God to keep saved people saved. And says, now to him who is able to protect or to keep you from stumbling. I'm grateful that my ability to stand one day pure, blameless, holy, righteous, saved, redeemed in the presence of God is not, listen church, is not based on my ability to live for God. It's based on Christ's ability, Brother Andrew, to hold me fast. We go on in the New Testament in Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you, that's salvation, will be faithful to complete it, that's sanctification, until the day of Christ Jesus, that's glorification. The same God that saved you knows how to keep you saved. And Paul testifies of this truth in his second letter to Timothy and says, I know whom I have believed, and I am confident, here it is again, that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. Now I once had a rather heated conversation with someone of a different denominational and doctrinal belief. It was a young lady actually raised in the denomination in which I was reared, the Pentecostal denomination, and they tend to be free will. They tend to be more of what theologians would call Arminian in their view of salvation. That just means they believe you can be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost. I've testified to you before That when I was in the ninth grade, if you had asked me, I thought I had been saved hundreds of times. Especially when I discovered girls in middle school. Saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost. She said she believed you could be saved and then lost and saved and lost. And she turned in her Bible to this text. I want to point out to you very simply that if this is your go-to passage about eternal security then it necessarily means if anyone is ever saved and lost, they can never be saved again. For verse 6 says, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. If that's the road you're going to go down, I said to her, it didn't go well, by the way, I would not recommend this. These days I now call that casting pearls before swine. And no, I did not just call her a pig. But I said, you, if that's your text, you may not believe once saved, always saved, but you believe once saved. And if ever lost, you are destined and damned for hell. There is no passage in the Bible properly understood and rightly divided that teaches a temporary salvation. But I could open up the blessed book of God and teach you from Genesis through the book of the Revelation. That anyone who has genuinely repented and believed 
You have been saved not on the basis of what you have done, but on the basis of what God through Christ has done for you. Your salvation is as secure as the power of the Savior Himself. These are flawed interpretations. Secondly now, I want to briefly consider the faithful interpretations. Now I've taught you in the past that there's only one correct interpretation to any passage of Scripture, though there can be many applications. I call these faithful interpretations in the plural because they each espouse things that are consistent with the rest of the Bible. The only question is, is that what's being taught here? For example, the Bible clearly teaches Christ is the only way to be saved. But that's not taught in Genesis 1.1. That's a true statement, but it's not found in that verse. The Bible clearly teaches of the victorious second coming of Jesus Christ. It just doesn't teach it in Romans 6.23. And similarly, these interpretations give Bible truths that are clearly taught in the Bible. The question is, is that what's being taught in this passage? So I will call them faithful interpretations. And again, good brothers and sisters will disagree. The first interpretation sees this text as describing a Christian who loses their reward. It is most commonly called the loss of rewards interpretation. I call this a faithful one because it does find consistency in the Word of God. Listen, dear church member. It is indeed tragic when a believer lives such a fruitless life that they stand before God with no reward for their life. You may jot down 1 Corinthians 3 verses 10 through 15. There the Bible speaks of the judgment seat of Christ and says that the sum total of our works, not our salvation, that's not a question, but the sum total of our work, our labor, our effort will be tried by fire to see if it's gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And the Bible says that there will be some that are saved yet as by fire because everything they accomplished, all they lived for, and all that they did was earthly stuff. Nothing of it was of eternal significance. And the Bible says they were saved as though by fire. Many commentators have called that a saved soul but a lost life. The hymn writer once asked, Must I go and empty-handed? Thus my dear Redeemer meet, not one crown with which to greet Him, lay no trophy at His feet. Paul warns of this potential in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, speaking in the term of an athlete, he says he disciplines his body lest after, after having preached to others, that is after having accomplished some wonderful things, he himself would be disqualified, ruled ineligible if you please. One translation says become a cast away. The athletic language is true in our day. Imagine the man who receives the kickoff, runs it 99 yards into the end zone. The stands go crazy until you see yellow laundry all over the field. There was a block in the back. There was an illegal move. And it negates everything that had otherwise been accomplished. If you don't think that's possible, ask Pete Rose. Is it possible that gambling on baseball could override a Hall of Fame career? Is it possible that the writer of Hebrews, in his obvious attempt to, to press them on to maturity... That's the, that's the overall context of this fifth and sixth chapter. Move on. Grow up. Go on. Don't turn back. Press forward in your service to Christ. Don't be like somebody who saved but barely saved and in the end lose all of their reward. That's a faithful interpretation in that. It teaches something that is taught elsewhere in the Bible. I will say there is much to commend about this view. It's held by men like David Allen, Jerry Vines, J. Vernon McGee, and others. It is so compelling that of all the views that I do not hold, it's the one I find the strongest. The second view is that this describes the sin unto death. The teaching that a genuine believer, so often warned and reproved by God, does not listen to his still small voice. 
does not respond to his chastening, his scourging, his spiritual whippings. And God in his providence, God in his discipline, enacts the most severe of all of his chastisement, that is premature death. 1 John 5, 16 teaches this truth, that there is a sin unto death that a believer can commit. The late Dr. Homer Lindsay, Jr., at that time the co-pastor of First Baptist Jacksonville, said that he was convinced there were lost members of the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville because God would have killed them by now if they were really his children living the way they're living. I would say that would be true of any church of any size. People who are genuinely saved, but they have strayed from the Lord In terrible ways. And one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard on that Bible truth was preached in this pulpit by Dr. Sam Cathy back in 2009. I'll try to post it later today on social media. It's simply entitled, The Sin Unto Death. And there are many who believe the writer is warning that if you don't grow up in the Lord and you turn back and you stray back into sin, rebellion, and disobedience, you may find yourself crossing a deadline. And God may take you home prematurely. There's a third faithful interpretation. It is the one that I have come to hold. It sees the person described in this text as one who is never truly saved. Someone who is never truly saved. Every church, including ours, has numbered among its membership those who give every outward verbal sign of being converted but there's been no inward change. They are professors, but not possessors. And if you know anything about the Word of God, you know the Bible teaches that such church members exist. Some have fooled themselves. False professors who will carry their claim all the way into the day of judgment. And in Matthew 7, Jesus said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? We'd say, didn't I preach good messages in your name? Didn't I faithfully pastor the church in your name? We cast out demons in your name and have done wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, says the Lord Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. By the way, that that is often translated iniquity, you worker of iniquity. That's what Jesus thinks about good works done apart from salvation. He calls them lawlessness and iniquity. It's worth noting Jesus says to this crowd of professing lost people, He does not say, I knew you, but I forgot about you. He doesn't say, I used to know you. He says, I never knew you. But there are others who are temporary professors of faith. They don't carry their facade to the judgment. They reveal their lost condition in this life. They are better described in 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it may be made manifest that none of them were of us. I point out quickly that John, in the text on the screen uses us and them language. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out that it may be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now point that out because the writer of Hebrews is going to similarly contrast and use this us versus them language. These are the primary interpretations of the text. You say, Pastor, how did you come, in light of the language of the text, how did you come to believe that this is a warning about people who say they are saved but are not genuinely converted? Well, we move from the primary interpretations of the text to the proper investigation of the text. Now, I do not have time to dissect the text in light of all three faithful interpretations, but I do want us to look at three very simple and specific things. Quickly now, we notice the description of these people. I admit, I concede. This is quite a faithful description of this crowd. Look in verse 4. They've once been enlightened, 
They've tasted of the heavenly gift. They've been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. That's a challenging phrase indeed. Verse 5, they've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now there is no question that an accurate interpretation of this text hinges on two questions. Who is he talking to and who is he talking about? I cannot personally overlook the fact that the writer has transitioned from talking about us to talking about them. Most notably in verse 6. If they have fallen away, verse 6, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Contrast that with verse 9, which is not in today's text. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. Those things which accompany salvation. He is clearly writing to saved people, but I believe now he's talking about a different group. And again, I submit these words are powerful, but these words, these phrases in verses 4 and 5, are not the typical words used to describe salvation. I think that everyone that is saved has done the things we read of in verses 4 and 5. But I believe biblically it is possible to do the things described in those verses and not be genuinely converted. John MacArthur comments, we should notice that this passage makes no reference at all to salvation. None of the normal terminology for salvation is used. In fact, not, no term used here is ever used elsewhere in the New Testament for salvation. And none should be taken to refer to it in this passage. That is, the phrases used here are not used anywhere else in the Bible to describe someone genuinely saved. And further, I would submit for your consideration that the phrases that are used in the Bible to describe a converted person are not used here. Words like saved, salvation, born again, redeemed, elect, chosen, in Christ, in Him, Beloved or brethren. The writer of Hebrews clearly knows the word saved. He uses it in chapter 7 and verse 25 and says that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost all who come to God by him. The writer clearly knows the word salvation. He uses it seven times in this letter, including in the last chapter where he describes Jesus as the author of eternal salvation. And in verse 9 of this very chapter, says, we've got better things in mind concerning you, things that accompany salvation. The Enduring Word commentary writes that we may safely say that from a human perspective, they had all appearance of salvation. Nevertheless, from the perspective of God's perfect wisdom, it is impossible to say on this side of eternity. And may I interrupt my own teaching to say, if this text tells us nothing else, it says it is tragic to claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but live such an immoral, ungodly, in and out, up and down, off and on, hot and cold, unreliable life before the Lord that people study your life and don't know whether we're talking about a saved person or a lost person. Heed that warning today if no other. Now, for those who would argue that these terms would necessarily describe a saved person, I remind you that in the parable of the soils that we looked at three weeks ago tonight, Jesus describes one group of false believers as having received the Word of God with joy. And then they spring up only to later wither away because of testing. Hold that thought. Richard Phillips in his commentary writes, This passage describes professors of faith who are within the church community, church members as we would say today, who experience the benefits of God's blessings in the church without ever personally committing themselves to faith in Christ. The description of these people. Note with me secondly the departure by these people. Verse 6 says that they have fallen away. Now, this is not the typical New Testament word used to describe apostasy. But it describes a falling away, a stumbling, a turning back. So we should ask, over what are they stumbling? From what have they fallen? To what have they turned back and why? 
For this you need to know, there is more than ample evidence to suggest the initial audience for the book of Hebrews are former priests. Those who had worked and served in the nearby temple and had been, at least on the surface, converted to Christ. And it is in the midst of intense persecution that the writer admonishes them to press on to maturity, to not turn back, but to go on to fullness in Christ. Why? Because Christ is better. He's greater. He's superior. Therefore, our series is called The Supremacy of Christ. He tells them repeatedly that Christ is better than your old synagogue. Greater than your old system. Superior to your old sacrifices. It seems to this preacher that some of them in the midst of hardship and persecution that is clearly taught in the balance of this book that some of them having tasted, having seen, having experienced the truth of the gospel turn back in times of persecution. Like the good seed that fell on the shallow soil received the word of God with joy and gladness sprang up initially but eventually withered away revealing that they had no genuine conversion. Jesus warns of this in Luke 9, 62, and says, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Church family, look right here and listen to your pastor this morning. You don't necessarily have to agree with my interpretation of this passage of Hebrews or be a Bible scholar to have observed in your own life people who've walked an aisle prayed a prayer, filled out a card, gone through the baptistry. They may for a while sing in the choir, teach in the Sunday school, serve on the staff. I've known of pastors of the church that in a season of hardship, testing, and trial, they turn back to that old life those old ways, those old beliefs. On the outside chance we have some college students still home for the holidays, you're going to face a dilemma in many high school and college and university campuses. Are you going to stay firmly committed to the things that you say that you believe? The things taught by your Christian father and your godly mother? The truths instilled into your mind by your sainted grandparents? The things taught to you in classroom and from pulpit alike? Or will you determine that the science teacher at the high school, the history teacher at the university, that they are the ones that are right? And will that time of testing and persecution and hardship cause you to turn away from what you have said that you believe and fall away from your supposed claim to Christ? You don't have to be an expert on the book of Hebrews to have known people who seem for a while to believe, only to depart from the faith. The description of these people, the departure of these people, note also the danger for these people. I don't know if there's a more staggering, sobering caution in the Word of God than what we find in verse 6. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. This is indeed a warning passage, so what is being warned about? I would share again, there is ample evidence to believe that at least some of the ones referenced here were Jewish priests who had made a verbal profession of faith in Christ and are now turning back. Think with me of these Jewish priests who had already once in their life rejected Christ. Think of the timeline of this book. Some of these may have been in the courtyard working the crowd when he asked for a choice. Yeah, we want Barabbas. When he asked, what will we do with this one called the Christ? Say, crucify him. And many scholars believe that's what's in reference to when the Bible says in verse 6, they again crucify. Could it be that these are among the ones who had already called for his crucifixion once? They had already repudiated his claims to deity in exchange for their dead religious system once, and now they are on the verge of doing it again. Once literally and now spiritually. If so, what does that mean for us? What could the danger be for us? Listen, dear friend, 
The danger for us today is that so long as anyone is in a conscious, intentional state of rejecting the claims of Christ, it remains today impossible for such a one to be converted through repentance. But I am grateful to God that still today things impossible with men are possible with God. But what is the danger? Underscoring the last several chapters of the book of Hebrews is a reference to the wilderness wanderings of Israel. In Numbers chapters 13 and 14, the Bible speaks of Israel sending in 12 spies across the Jordan into the land of Canaan. Ten come back with a faithless report. Two come back with a faithful report. And you remember the story. Israel voted the wrong way. They rebelled and they angered God. God said, Moses, you and Joshua and Caleb, y'all step back from all these rebels. I'm going to kill them all. Moses interceded. And God changed not his punishment, but he changed his process. I'm still going to let them all die here in the desert. It just won't be all at one time. It'll take 40 years. When the Israelites heard about the judgment of God, do you remember what they said? I'm paraphrasing, but they said, we'll change our vote. (laughs) We're sorry, Lord. We'll go in now. We'll cross the Jordan. We'll run the Canaanites out of the land. And God said, Moses, you better tell them not to go in. I've already made up my mind about their destiny. They went in anyway and fell by the edge of the Canaanite sword. Could the writer of Hebrews here be warning some in this room today that there is going to come a day. You reject Christ now, there's going to come a day you'll change your mind. There's coming a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But like the rebellious Israelites on the banks of the Jordan, for some, the desire to be renewed to repentance will be eternally too late. The danger for these people. As important as doctrine is, I want to conclude this lesson with a third main point that I've labeled the practical implications of the text. I don't mind telling you I did not get to this point in the first service, and so you can share this with those you know who come at 9 o'clock. What are the practical implications for us today? And I would add that each of these implications are valuable to us regardless of which faithful interpretation you would hold. First, there's what I've labeled the matter of proof. The matter of proof. I'm talking about the proof of your salvation. I find it more than a little ironic that this text, which is used by many to reject the doctrines of eternal security and assurance, is actually one of the greatest passages to teach that you can have a no-so salvation. For if it were possible for a saved person to be lost again, it would be impossible for them to be saved once again. But the context here is spiritual growth and maturity. You can see that in verses 7 and 8, which I believe is a thinly veiled reference to the parable of the soils. There's one ground that produces good results. There's one that produces thorns and thistles. We should ask, if I'm looking for proof of my salvation, every eye right here, listen carefully. What is the proof of my salvation? Listen carefully, church family. Assurance of salvation is never gained by looking back to a past event. You're living like the devil now? Don't have a heart for the things of God now? No passion for obedience to Christ? No hunger and thirst for righteousness? And somebody asks, how do you know that you're saved? And you point back to a prayer that you prayed at six years old at vacation Bible school? There's nothing about your life that looks like a Christ follower, but you point back to a date that your mama wrote in the front of a Gideon New Testament when you were nine years old coming home from kids' day camp. Assurance of salvation is never going to be gained by looking back to a past event, but by looking inside to a present reality. Professing believer, if you're not walking with God... 
I didn't say you're definitely not law, you're not saved. You may be backslidden. But I'm saying if you're not walking with God, there's no biblical reason for you to have assurance of salvation. You should be wondering and wrestling, is my salvation sincere? Is my conversion genuine? This passage should actually be used to bring about a great confidence in salvation. But my confidence is not in anything I have done. But I'm confident that I'm not turning back. I'm not giving in. In fact, when I look at my life, I'm growing up. But I'm going on in my walk with Jesus Christ. The matter of proof. Then there's the matter of progress. Closely connected to this. Verses 7 and 8 just fit right in the context of where he's been, talking about leaving the elementary principles of Christ, moving on and growing up, producing good fruit for the cause of Christ. Verses 7 and 8 describes one piece of ground, not two different fields, one field, but it produces different results. There's no question that the context here, the main thrust of Hebrews 6, is related to spiritual maturity and progress in the faith. Verse 1 opens admonishing us to leave the basics and move on. So I'll say again, the greatest assurance you have that you are in Christ. Please know that I don't want you to leave today with a question. I want you to leave today with confidence and assurance. But the greatest assurance you could have that you are in Christ is that you're growing in Christ. Serving Christ. That there is in your heart a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. There's one final practical implication. I've labeled it the matter of prayer. And I confess that this is just a pastoral word in conclusion. There's no specific verse or phrase in today's text dealing with prayer. But I think there are some things that this text would call us to pray about. For example, you don't know who is a lost church member. So pray. If someone rejects Christ, it's impossible for them to be saved. Nobody's ever gone into eternity rejecting the gospel of Christ and simultaneously been saved. But I say again, things that are impossible with men are possible with God. That hard case in your family... That tough case in your sphere of influence. It will be impossible for them to be renewed to repentance by the effort of man. Spirit of God, do what only you can do. Soften the heart. Till the soil. Plant the seed. Cause them to understand the gospel. It's prayer. And the final prayer admonition is when you have occasion to doubt your own profession of faith. And I submit if you've never doubted whether you are sincerely saved, you've not thought much about your salvation. You can seek counsel from other people, but the best person to seek counsel from is the one called the Wonderful Counselor. Pray to Him. Ask Him, Lord, reveal my spiritual condition. In Psalm 139, David prayed it like this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In World War II, General George Patton was known for always wanting to be on the offense. He said he didn't like to have to spend American blood to buy the same ground twice. Interviewed by a newspaper, he said there'll be time for rest when the war is over. Not only is retreat out of the question, so is staying in place. My motto, he said, is go forward. And in the Christian life, the best defense against turning back is to keep moving forward. To say with the hymn writer of old, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back.